Hey everyone, today I'm going to be talking about libgit2, nodegit, and the git binary itself a little bit. Mainly, how do you use git inside of your applications? And I don't mean your dev workflow, I mean how do you let your end user do stuff with git inside the application you're building, much like git crack and desktop does. First off, I'd like to point out that we have some existing blog posts about explaining libgit2 a little bit and how it works. This is going to go a little bit more in depth than that blog post, but you can go give it a read if you want. And then we have another blog post in which we really kind of like dig into why we started migrating to using the native git binary instead of using libgit2. Now we're still in that migration process and this blog post is from a year ago, so we're still migrating and doing our thing there, but you know, might be a good read. So let's dig into what libgit2 even is. It's a library written in C. So that means that there are some native C bindings for your applications, but there's also bindings to other languages too, such as Go, C Sharp, Objective-C, Python, PHP, Lua, Ruby, and Node.js using NodeGit, which we're using in our application today. Now, one thing I did notice is that there isn't a Wasm implementation of it, but Maybe there could be one because it's written in C, it might not be too hard to port over just depending on what type of syscalls are happening under the hood. As an open source project, there have been a lot of contributors to libgit2, but by far the most active and prolific has been Edward Thompson. However, we even contribute back to uh, the project from here at Gitkraken, such as uh, developers at the company named Ian Hattendorf, John Alden, and Julian Mesa. Libgit2 is used by some of the largest companies working with Git that you know about such as Azure, GitHub, GitLab, and Bitbucket. They're all most likely using internal forks, but they're using it probably on their back end in the server as a server style thing, whereas here at Gitkraken, we're using it more on the client side. But it just goes to show that it's a very influential project and it's very important that it keeps being maintained and used. So earlier I mentioned NodeGit as well. NodeGit are Node.js bindings to libgit2, and that's really the main thing that we're using at our company. If you want to use NodeGit, it's actually pretty straightforward. You can check out some of the examples here. Like in one example, we are cloning down a repo, nice and easy, pretty simple. But we also maybe get into a more advanced example with uh, opening a NodeGit repo, getting the most recent commit, and then printing the commit message. All of these kind of things are really useful for an application like Git Crack and Desktop. If you open up Git Crack and Desktop, you can actually see a whole bunch of places where we're actually using NodeGit right now. One place is maybe the toolbar. In that toolbar, most of those actions are calling out to NodeGit, but there's also the option of turning on the experimental feature for using native Git. And just knowing that cloning, fetching, doing a whole bunch of these things like pushing and pulling, those are fundamentally tied to NodeGit the whole application is Git focused, really. But another thing is you might see it down in the commit graph. The commit graph is really nice to actually get a visual of how your branching flow works and who's working on what when. You can also click something in that commit graph and then head over to the commit panel over on the side. That's where you get a lot more like Git details and things that help you understand why that code was done, what files were changed, things like that. So you might be wondering, why are we migrating? Well. Technically, look at Git itself. Git is making new releases all the time with new features, new things that they're just doing. And to get that into our application, it first has to be implemented into libgit2, and then we need to port that into nodegit, and that process has some lag time. And if we want to get the latest and greatest features and performance improvements, etc., we kind of just need to do the native Git instead. Some of the specific features that we actually need from Git that are not available in libgit2 or nodegit yet are things like Scalar, which is a tool for large monorepos or just large repos in general. Think about maybe how Microsoft or Google have very large monorepos. It could get really slow. Scalar was created by Microsoft to solve problems like that. Other features we want are things like large file support because Git doesn't really handle binary files that well, especially if they're larger than say 100 megabytes. It can really eat up a lot of space in your Git work history of just like, you know, files that we don't care that much about the changes over time, etc. Other things that we want to get are maybe Git hooks or SSH config instead of HTTP config. Maybe using subtrees or Git bisect. These are all features that just don't exist in libgit2 or nodegit in a way that we can use them right now without having to put in a lot of effort behind it. Another major reason to migrate away from libgit2 and nodegit to just using the native git is because 
we might want to lower the bus factor. And the bus factor is basically the amount that we are depending upon one person to actually keep this thing alive and going. If we look, Edward Thompson does a lot of awesome work, and we couldn't have gotten any of this done without a lot of his effort. However, it is just one single point of failure, and that single point of failure is not great for longevity and sustainability. And if we look at some of the other maintainers, they haven't touched the project in a long time. So the top four contributors, if we look at that, Edward Thompson is really the only person putting in work. And if we look at his history, there was even a period where he just wasn't touching it that much. Now that you know why we're migrating, you might want to figure out how we're doing that migration. And it could be interesting, but really it's actually kind of straightforward. All we're doing is going function by function. So commit and fetch, or renaming branches, or getting the ahead and behind count. All of these things we can do one by one piecemeal without having to do the entire thing at once, which makes it a lot easier to you know, test and verify that we're not breaking things for our users. You might be wondering what's left to do. Well, it turns out quite a bit. The main thing is we are trying to prioritize features and UX improvements to the applications, things that help you and your team be more productive and collaborate easier. Those take higher priority than migrating to native Git. Even though there will be some good UX wins from the performance of native Git, we just want to make sure we're doing the things in the right order and we will get there in time. So some of the things that we're still working on are things like blame or patch or rebase or um, also rewording or amending commits, local and remote branch actions. There's a lot to do and we'll get there eventually. Even though we have a good plan for the migration, it doesn't mean that it's easy because there are several challenges to doing this. One of the main challenges is the fact that Git focuses on human readable output. What that means is that we have to parse that output with regular expressions that can be really, really hard to understand from our perspective as developers. I think I know how we all feel about regular expressions, right? So instead, luckily, Git is shipping a dash Z flag that we can now use, and that gives us a more computer readable output much less complex regular expressions, and that's awesome. Another tricky aspect actually has to do with how varied people's environments might be. So as a developer, you might be on Windows, you might be on Mac, you might be on Linux, and they all kind of deal with SSH and HTTPS authentication and config in different ways. Uh, maybe the version of Git you have locally is different from the one that we want to ship with, and you're used to and want to use the one that you have locally. There's a whole bunch of just very broad cross-compatibility issues to worry about there. That mostly sums up what I was trying to get at with this video today. I wanted to talk about libgit2 and nodegit and how we're using them, how they could be used in your apps, and what they kind of do. And I really wanted to sum up like why we're doing our migration, where we are with it, and even though we may never finish this migration, uh, you know, like we're probably still going to be using libgit2 in certain places, but we can still get some of the newer features and performance improvements of the native Git binary as well. And that just makes our applications better for Git Crack and Desktop and the rest of our platform. So if you enjoyed videos like this, please like and subscribe, and uh, I'll see you again soon.